Hello, fellow ag nerds. Happy 2021 to you. My name is Tim Hamrich, and if you believe that ag innovation is part of the solution to our world's most important problems, you have found the right show. Some of my personal favorite stories are about creative solutions that solve a seemingly unsexy and maybe underappreciated problem, but when you dig into them a little bit deeper, you realize what significant opportunities they are. We certainly have an example of one of those on the show here for you today. We're talking about the use of sensors to better understand the quality and conditions of stored grain in real time. We have on the show Naeem Zafar. Naeem is a seven-time serial entrepreneur. He's a five-time CEO and has multiple successful exits. He's currently the co-founder and CEO of Telesense, an Internet of Things company creating real-time wireless sensing and predictive analytics for the stored grain industry. Now, a lot of the attention on sensors has to do with agronomy, you know, soil and water and canopy. And I think all that's great, but think about this with stored grain. Every year, we produce billions of bushels of corn and soybeans and wheat just in the U.S. alone. A lot of that is stored and handled multiple times, maybe at first in farm bins, then in a local grain elevator, then maybe on a barge or a rail car, then at a processing facility or export house where it goes on to be handled even further. So there are several opportunities for the quality of the grain to be affected. And a lot of the current solutions for checking that quality are mostly still manual, you know, sending someone up there to open up the bin, look at it and even smell it to determine how the commodity is doing. Now, this is a really cool episode about this problem and how technology can help. And as you might imagine from his bio, Naeem is also just a really fascinating person to listen to and learn from. Telesense is a portfolio company of Fulcrum Global Capital. The team at Fulcrum, you might remember, partnered with me last year and introduced us to some really fascinating companies. And I'm excited to continue that relationship here for a few episodes in 2021. One thing that struck me last year was just how diverse their portfolio companies were. You know, from meat processing to cash cover crops to soil health and removing heavy metals to bioplastics to grain. Uh, We covered just a really wide swath of agriculture with just those companies. And that's something that venture partner John Perriam says is a reflection of their global thesis. From a top down perspective, the breadth of our portfolio is really a reflection on how broad our thesis starts with global food production, right? That's massive. And then we break it up into really big verticals in agriculture and animal health and then ag tech. We intentionally look at as broad a collection of potential investments as we can. I will say that we don't intentionally, okay, we need to fill this box. We need to fill this box. That breadth of discovery from our perspective and and conversations that we're willing to have with all different types of companies within that, I think has led naturally to us being able, we believe, to identify really great companies in those spaces. But it wasn't an intentional other than when we determined, well, where do we want to look? We want to look in this really broad area. So part of it is probably fortuitous on our part, but it came from careful planning on, on where we thought opportunities would come. And that wasn't narrowly focused at all. That was, that was obviously quite broad. One huge benefit to these fulcrum episodes is getting to hear from the investor about what attracted them to the company before you hear from the founders themselves. I think this is really beneficial for a couple of reasons. I mean, first, for you entrepreneurs out there, you get some insight into how this process happens, which definitely could be helpful for you down the road. But secondly, for all of us, I think this really just does a great job of contextualizing the story of the company into a more broader framework about the future of agriculture. Fulcrum Managing Partner Dwayne Cantrell describes how Telesense first got on their radar. A year ago, November, I was uh, actually presenting at a conference to about 250 global uh, insurance companies in uh, Silicon Valley. And I was doing a kind of a keynote address around the coming disruption of agriculture. And most everybody in that room was insurers of agriculture. And I would say, um, respectfully, very few of them had an idea about what's, what's going on in agriculture. But at that same conference, there were several agricultural companies presenting, uh, startups, and Telesense was one of those. And so uh, while I uh, addressed the audience an hour or two later, 
Naeem Zafar, who's the founder of Telesense, was presenting as well. And he and I got connected later uh, that afternoon and began a discussion and really liked what he was talking about because we've always had an interest in and believe that the supply chain and logistics part of agriculture is antiquated and outdated. You know, I came from a consumer products retail background, and we probably that industry is 25, 30 years ahead of agriculture when it comes to logistics supply chain management. And so we, we've known this has been a big concern. And one of the issues of agriculture is that the point of harvest, if you will, for grains is the highest point of quality of grains. They do nothing but degrade from that point forward. So as John mentioned earlier that, you know, we look at ag, ag tech, animal health, but we also look at production and yield. We look at food waste. We look at food safety and security as kind of three questions we look to. Well, this clearly fit into a food waste technology, but also a, per- a productivity and yield because it's not, you're, you're eliminating loss and you're improving the quality. So it's both a grain loss technology and management and monitoring of grains and a marketplace value play, but it also is predictive in the sense that it can forecast out the the the, the, the inevitable degradation of the grain based upon those environmental factors. And so the simplicity of the technology, the kind of the breakthrough uh, approach, we think in terms of uh, again, uh, historical and antiquated kind of grain management systems. Today's mostly uh, silo-based systems are, are cable systems. Uh, this advances the monitoring of, of grains in, in uh, uh, grain silo environments to a, to a whole new level that is far advanced over cable systems that are out there today. But it's actually not even enough to have a real problem identified and a novel way to collect data about that problem. The insights need to be actionable. And that's another aspect that attracted the team to this particular investment, according to venture partner Kevin Lockett. Uh, Everyone always talks about real-time data. I think this was a a perfect example of how real-time data in the hands of the right folks, they could actually make Uh, real-time decisions that matter, right? And that actually prevent losses like Dwayne talked about earlier or allow them to better manage the grain. And so that business model, along with the fact that you've seen cost of things like sensors and so forth continue to decrease. And so there's very little money that goes in up front from the customer side and the value that they're receiving in real time greatly exceeds sort of the subscription payment that they're paying in terms of value. So it was we, we always look at ROI. What's really the ROI? Is it, is it simple calculation? Is it very easily understood? And, and what we always talk about is, is it sort of a no-brainer to the end customer? What we really liked about this opportunity is not only Naeem, who's, who's fantastic, but it was one of those where we also felt like the business model was just just fit ideally into what the market was looking for. Well, I think you're going to agree with the Fulcrum team as you hear from Telesense founder and CEO, Naeem Zafar. I'll drop you into the conversation here where he's explaining how he came from outside of ag to find this particular problem to be solved. So the thing about agriculture is, and there are many problems to be solved, what to plant, how to minimize disease, how to optimize yield. We are doing none of the above. Our focus is post-harvest grain. Once you harvest grain, wheat, corn, canola, doesn't matter, it never improves in quality. It goes downhill. So question is, you're going to make dozens of decisions. When to sell it? How long to store it? Should we blend it? What kind of treatment should it get? Fumigation? So all these decisions are made with patchy data and intuition. So what we are doing is solving that problem, that if we can provide useful information, insights about your stored grain, you'll be able to improve your profit, reduce your spoilage, improve worker safety, spend less money on operations. So everything is all about improving post-harvest grain profits. That's what we're focused on. Problem is worldwide and problem is huge. And, you know, maybe break down that part of the problem that is that the grain, you know, the quality just tends to deteriorate over time, which I think everyone will naturally understand that. But what data points can someone who has grain stored 
be looking at and, and how might that inform a decision? Maybe you can give us an example. Sure. So what happens is the grain is a living, breathing thing. Uh, biological activity takes place. If moisture gets in, and moisture can get in from uh, rain, or there was some leak someplace or whatever, or you brought in grain which was high moisture, so biological activity can start. And slowly, this thing heats up, develops a hot spot. So in the worst case scenario, there's a combustion, there's explosion, there's fire. But if it doesn't go that far, you still can have uh, mold, you can have crud, and at the end of the day, you know, if it's really, really bad, you throw it away. Or if it's bad, you make it animal feed. If it's kind of bad, you blend it with good stuff. So that's the reason a lot more people have allergies, food allergies, because butter crud is actually being mixed in with good stuff. So you want to avoid all of the above. So if you can manage the moisture level inside the grain and the tannins, the temperature, and you can use other leading indicator of problems like level of carbon dioxide coming out of the grain pile. Because if they're pests inside, which are consuming oxygen, generating CO2, and CO2 level goes up from 400 parts per million to 1,500, you got a problem. And that's the kind of things which uh, sensors and software can monitor continuously, repeatedly, inexpensively. And, you know, let's stick with the grain pile example what can a farmer do? I mean, I, I have built grain piles before. You buy these really expensive tarps. You cover it up. You lock it down with fans. You really don't want to cut into there until you absolutely are ready to pick up the whole thing so that you're not exposing it to the weather. You know, what can be done if the sensors do pick up something? Good point. So, of course, if the vertical silo, you know, you can drain the silo and just rotate the grain. That's easy to do. Uh, so what happens in the pile, you have three things you can do. Depending on the severity or whatever, you can insertion cooling tubes and insert air through the tubes to cool down the hot spot and break it up. Number two, if there's some portion is being impacted, let's say the, the leftmost corner is being impacted, you kind of make a plan early in January to either sell that and make a contract to sell that portion as animal feed, or you plan to get some grade one grain, make a contract, you can blend it. So you don't want to be surprised when you open it up in April. You want to have this take action taken in January, February, when you have a lot more freedom. The knowledge is king. When you know what's going on, you can make a sensible choice. That's what all is about. Avoid the surprise. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I have to tell you, I, you know, I'm a former grain guy. I love this market. I mean, I think, you know, we've talked a lot about hardware and software, IoT on this show. And this is one where, I really think people are willing to pay to have this done. I mean, they are paying. They're paying big dollars, as you've already said. And I know what kind of volume and what kind of market size is out there for this. It's massive. How did you find this market? Because I think a lot of people, when they think ag tech, they immediately go to soil and water sensors or something like that. How did you yeah. find this? So, you know, I'm an electrical engineer. I have uh, started companies in the past. This is my seventh company. When I sold my last company to Oracle, I was looking for what is the next big thing going to be? And I focused on IoT, Internet of Things. Then the question was, what's the use case? What industry has not been touched by technology that much? And after some analysis, I came to construction and agriculture. So then it was a matter of talking to people. And we ran into a large cooperative, and they invited us in to see if we can help them out with some of the advanced technology. So I went to the field talked to many people, grain handling people, looked at the cable system and decided that, you know, you're spending a lot of manual labor going out and writing down the temperature values by hand. Could we automate that? So we made a solution for that, which we still have, still sell, that if you have cable system, can we suck the data out and send it wirelessly to the cloud when we can analyze it so you don't have to send a guy out there? So that was our first product. Then we realized, okay, that's good, but what if we don't have a cable system? So then we came up with the idea of measuring CO2, measuring moisture, uh, looking at the airflow. And, you know, it was evolution. So over the last four years, we have evolved with now multiple products. And we have, you know, all the usual suspects that are customer, Cargill and CHS and ADM and Bungies and a bunch of other co-ops. And you're hitting on the big ones there, the ABCDs, the big co-ops, et cetera. But also, there's this trend of more on-farm storage as well. I imagine a technology like this is probably 
you know, even those customers are a likely candidate for something like this. Absolutely. That that was our whole point was to make it so easy that you don't need an expert to install it. So we'll actually start selling in a few months. We'll be have an online store when you'll be able to simply go in and order a bunch of these spears or this uh, other product we call Spider with the CO2 sensor and install it yourself. Spider, you put one in the plenum, one in the headspace. It has magnetic feet, nothing to drill. Click, click, you're done. So you're absolutely right. We think there's a huge opportunity with farmers who don't want to spend out $20,000 to look at this thing. Margins are thin in this business. You got to get something they can afford, they can justify. And what is, you know, let's walk through kind of the economics. If you're talking like one, let's say it's a 50,000 bushel bin, what are the costs of something like that? And is it something you have to buy every year? So there are a couple of ways we sell. We have a leasing model or you can purchase and have a, but there's always a small subscription because we're sending the data continuously using cellular network. We're analyzing it continuously, sending the alerts. So, uh, you know, $50,000 bin, uh, bushel bin, that's a pretty standard size bin. So if you have a bin, you'll probably put a spider on the top, one on the bottom. And so there's something like that. Either it could be leased and that should be about $200 a month. Or if you want to buy it up front, it's like $2,000 up front. And then there's a, a subscription fee. It probably comes out to be less than $50 a month. Maybe it's $40 a month. So I'm talking about two, three thousand dollars a year up and running. Or you can just rent it, yeah. So you're probably talking about somewhere in the neighborhood of like maybe like five cents a bushel. Actually, our target is two cents a bushel. Now, of course, two cents a, cents a bushel works for the larger one. Fifty thousand is a pretty small bin. It may come out to be more like three, four cents a bushel. But idea is typically people have multiple bins and have large things. Two our target is people are comfortable paying two cents a bushel. Oh, I believe it. I mean Two cents a bushel is a very normal discount uh, for for quality, and and you know if you're keeping the discounts as at a minimum uh, from this, or, or even worse, you're avoiding a complete disaster. You know it's it's both insurance and seems like something that could be a sound you know business decision. That's exactly right, and the convenience that you can you can go to Florida and still be able to look at what's going on with my bins on your mobile phone. That gives you peace of mind. And then you can take action. And this is where we are today. What we want to go tomorrow is to send you a text message, turn on the fans on bin number seven at midnight for eight hours. That's a very specific message. Why? Because we have analyzed the moisture in, of the grain. We know the moisture of air outside. We know the weather forecast. So we know that will condition the grain correctly. And farming doesn't want to look at lots of data and looks read charts. A text message like do this at this time for this long. Yeah, I got it, buddy. Yeah, smart bins. Exactly, exactly. And in the future, this could even be uh, connected with the actuation system. So you don't even have to send a message. Say, by the way, Mr. Farmer, we, we are turning on the fans on the bin. Sleep tight. Huh. Yeah, that'll, that'll be phase two. Well, and, and not to keep harping on how great of a market this is, but, you know, not only are there billions of bushels of grain grown in the United States every year, it may be stored on a farm, and then in an elevator, and then on a barge, and then in an export house. And so that grain is being handled multiple times, each of which would have an incentive to use something like this. That's exactly right. And barge is especially very interesting use case. Because every year, several barges catch fire. Losing a barge, that's like a $300,000 loss right there, just on the grain itself. So this barge, there is no electronics, there is no way, and the barge is traveling down. What we have, the spear, with the rechargeable battery, once you charge the battery, it is good for two years, and it's the same charger you use for your Android phone. So using uh, you know five or six spears on a barge is really saving money. We have large companies using it today, and we think that use case is very unique. Now we're applying that to rail cars, so grain transport may be even a more interesting use case than grain storage. So interesting. Well, I know, you know, there are other bin sensors out there. I don't know much about them, admittedly, but why do you think this didn't exist before? Has there been a technological breakthrough here or just nobody's brought this to the market or talk to us kind of about the landscape? No, there is a couple of technical advances which made it possible. One is the cellular connectivity, the cost of data, because, you know, before, it's like getting a cell phone plan. They're like $25 a month. Now with IoT, there are data plans which are much more affordable. 
So like, you know, $2 a month, if you're just sending a very small amount of data, that was an enabler. The second thing is the, the artificial intelligence analytics and presentation industry just really came to be in the last two, three, four, five years. Before that, it was complicated, expensive. There were no tools, APIs. So all the pieces came together. And third thing was to really focus at it that is there a way this market could be served? And uh, I think we were lucky that we had the technical chops. We were able to attract people who have the agriculture chops and the serendipity came to be. And hence, here we are. It took us four years to get here, but it was really the cloud came to a place, the AI and wireless technology came to a certain place and cellular connectivity came to a certain place. So all that came together. So for example, on the large farms, we are also using a technology called LoRa WAN. LoRa WAN, low range. I mean, that's a new technology, but it wasn't very popular until very recently. So now with LoRa WAN, we can cover a two miles area with you know, a single gateway. So this was not possible. So a bunch of things happened recently, which enabled this. I know when I was running grain elevators, we had somebody that we would send out with a tape measure just to measure how much grain was in the bin. I mean, I don't know if that's something that this could do as well, or it, maybe that's a little bit of a different problem. No, no, it's a way we are thinking about it very much so. So we are looking at a technology, which we have prototype already working, and uh, we will be announcing some interesting things next year. I don't want to talk too much about it because I don't want to steal the thunder, but we absolutely... By next year, you'll have something like that. We'll tell you the quantity and the quality. And and what about competitors? I mean, we talked about, you know, these bin cables and how expensive they are, but other sensors out there, are there a lot of people rushing to this market? Yes, it is attracting attention, no doubt. The competitors come in two buckets. So there are companies who have been making this cable system, fan system for the last 20, 30, 40 years. And they make cable system, then, you know, they're expensive and they're complicated mechanical devices. So they are still competitor, although we have a box which interfaces with the system and makes them wireless. So there's a bunch of competitors like that, like OPI, Extra, and Ralph Boone. The second bucket of competitors are some startup companies which are just trying to create a canister or a portable sensor. I just know of two of them. One is focused on fumigation and phosphine detection, which is not our focus. Uh, the second one is a small pods so you can toss inside the grain. They are still underfunded. They only have raised about $2 million as compared to we are venture funded and have a lot more customers. So, so they're, they're, they're chasing us. They're a couple of years behind us, but that keeps us on our toes because there is a problem to be solved and money to be made. It will attract attention. If nobody was doing that, I'll be more concerned that am I chasing the wrong thing. So it's good to see some crowd as long as you're leading the pack. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you have some experience with that. Talk about your entrepreneurial journey. Yeah. So like I said, I was an electrical engineer, a Brown University undergraduate, University of Minnesota graduate. I started my first company in Minneapolis, actually, and that was uh, had to do with chip design. And came to California in Silicon Valley, and uh, one company, we have an iPhone with a fingerprint sensor, Touch ID. We invented that technology. Apple ended up buying that uh, with two hands in between. Uh, my last company was in mobile security. We sold it to Oracle. So how people can uh, log in from their cell phone to uh, read corporate documents and emails securely. Uh, other companies had to do with chip designs. So, you know, living in Silicon Valley, very much immersed in advising people, investing in companies and learning about the latest technology. I'm also a professor at University of California, Berkeley and Northeastern. So that keeps you young because a lot of your students come up with smart ideas and you're always you know, interacting with them. So it has been a learning experience for me. And how has it been different, if at all, in ag tech versus uh, other industries? So ag tech has its unique challenges. Uh, the challenges are that you're selling to probably, I have to say, one of the more skeptical audience in the world. You know, so which is a good thing. You know, you really have to prove it. You can't just make up a story and be fast talking. You got to deliver value. And second thing you realize is that agriculture margins are thin. And a lot of this, uh, they barely make enough money. So you really have to deliver value. If if they're spending two two pennies a, bu a bushel, they got to see a value of four to ten cents a bushel. Otherwise, it doesn't justify. So we had to tighten our execution. And we have to demonstrate the value. 
And uh, so it is, it's a tough market to sell to. Maybe that's one reason you don't see a lot of people selling to these people. How do you roll out a product like this? Is it direct sales? You've got people kind of, you know, setting up meetings like a software, uh, you know, a typical SaaS model. Um, what is the distribution and, and sort of sales channel for something like this? The truth is we're still learning it. You know, we haven't mastered that. But we have direct sales people. We have uh, uh, SDRs, sales development reps who call up and uh, you know, make an appointment. Can we stop by and show you what we got? And we get usually pretty positive reception. Then we have direct sales people in Minnesota, Nebraska, Illinois, Wisconsin. They will visit a co-op. So we're starting with co-ops and elevators. And we talk about what we do and how it has helped other people. They say, you know, let me try it on a pile on a bin, see how it does. And then next season, they say, okay, that was pretty good. Let's expand that. We're also signing up dealers who already have trust relationship with growers and handlers. So two or three companies like that, especially with Duraccio in Iowa, a lot of uh, storage things got destroyed. So they're using a temporary storage, the silo bags, the long tubes. So, you know, so we're dealing with one of the dealers who sell those things. So they're saying, okay, you got this temporary storage. Maybe you want to monitor it. The spears are perfect solution. So I answered your question three ways. Direct sales, especially for larger co-ops. Dealers for on-farm storage and smaller co-ops. And next year, we're starting an online store. Very cool. Well, yeah, yeah, and it makes a lot of sense to work with the, you know, the bagging companies or the storage companies because obviously they don't they don't want a bad experience with their product, and this can help ensure that that doesn't happen. So that makes a lot of sense. Very interesting. Well, uh, talk to us about artificial intelligence, and you're a teacher in addition to an entrepreneur. Maybe help us wrap our minds around, you know, is there an artificial intelligence? element to this? And, and if so, why? And maybe that'll help us start to understand the applications for artificial intelligence in agriculture. Sure, sure. So idea is, with artificial intelligence comes in is, can you predict the, the stored value of a grain into the future? So we are coming up with a index, a fine grain index, which will tell you what's the quality of the grain. So let's take an example that it's like your, your credit score, your FICO score. What is it? Well, it's a whole bunch of complicated financial history packaged into a single number. You know, Tim has a number. I, I'm making this up, of course. Tim's credit score is 823, names is 765. So that tells the bank to give Tim's a better rate on his loans and so on and so forth. What if we can come up with some number like that for stored grain? So it's not just number two yellow corn I got. I got number two yellow corn with a grain storage quality index of 822, because I've been babying it, I've been keeping it fresh, I've been monitoring the moisture, versus my neighbor who goes to Florida, doesn't show up, and he's called number two yellow, but number two yellow is about like 650 on a, this scale. If you can do that, that opens up all kinds of interesting ideas. You suppose you have three bins, two of them in a the shadow of the first one. Number two is four degrees cooler than the first one because sun, the way sun hits it, the way the oak tree is. Well, maybe they're going to behave differently. How if you store the grain for nine months, one is slightly cooler than the other one. One of them has a leak. Machine learning learns that behavior. It learns the thermal profile of each bin. And it can use that knowledge to predict the future quality. Let me give you a practical example. Suppose you get an order for um, the 5,000 ton from a customer of, you know, corn or barley, whatever. Okay, now you have barley stored in 52 bins in 11 locations. You only have to empty six bins to fulfill the order. Which six? That's a difficult question if you're an elevator or a co-op. Well, what do you need to know? Well, you need to know several things. You need to know the quantity in each of the 52 bins the quality of each bin. You need to know the cost of logistics from each of 11 locations and the availability of labor. And if you're lucky, you really want to know the future expected quality of each of the 52 bins, three months out, six months out, and nine months out. If you knew that, you'll make a very good decision. People leave a lot of profit on the table, but you just don't know. Where artificial intelligence comes in is to provide you that data.
we should be able to do all that analysis and tell you empty bin number 23, 26, and 39. Because in three months, they're going to go a notch below in quality level. And you have labor availability right now. So these decisions could be made by software. We can assist. And that's my vision. That's how you bring profitability back into this business. It's going to take me a couple of years to get there, but that's the direction. That makes a ton of sense. I have stayed up all night loading trains and trying to mix and blend bins to get the quality just right and doing it by hand and running samples to the, you know, to the machine and trying to figure out, oh, we went too high on that one, too low on that one. Uh, Some software helping with that at three in the morning when you're trying to make an incentive on loading a train of grain would be awfully nice to have. So, I mean, I, I have experienced these problems firsthand and I know how important they are. You're certainly you know, positioning yourself here for a future traceability play, too, I would think. Exactly. Because this all nicely plays into the whole journey. Where was it harvested? Where was it stored for how long? Did it have an adverse effect in between? Trans-oceanic transport is another interesting area. So more we learn about the ecosystem, more we see the opportunity to add value. And I think you touched on it earlier, but I can't remember what you said. Generally, is the hardware having to be purchased uh, every year, or how long will that hardware at last? No, hardware will last multiple years. We have customers using it for five years, and it's still going. So I don't know what the life is, but you know, if you bang it up and abuse it, maybe it's three years. But I, we have not had that situation. We are still too young to have returns. So short end is, I'm going to just guesstimate that five years hardware life is reasonable. And this uh, LoRa technology, has it made it to where you can connect these devices anywhere, or do you still run into connectivity issues? You know, connectivity issue is always there because if you're way out in the boonies, uh, you don't have surfaces to reflect signal. But LoRa's technology is turning out to be very reliable. So you can go from one gateway, you can have all kinds of 200 devices which could be sprinkled over it two-mile radius, and they still make great connection. You know, we're still learning about connectivity. Connectivity is always a problem. It's never simple. You know, cellular networks are not as reliable as your Verizon and AT&T makes it out to be. But the fact is, we the way we have gotten around that is by uh, what we call local storage mode. So even if we lose the signal, we remember the data for up to two days or two weeks, and we can transmit when we find the signal. So we overcome those issues. And nothing has ended up in an auger or in a grain leg yet? Nothing has. Well, one ball had ended up in auger, and I have the pictures to show. But uh, that's why we changed our method. We said we're not going to just toss balls in a pile of grain. We've got to be smart about it. Either they're mounted or they are inserted so they can be retrieved. So we have made some changes to accommodate that situation. That never happens again. Great. Well, and how about the user interface part of this? It's an app. And um, is it going to alert the person with the grain bins when there's a problem? Is it something they monitor daily? How's the user you know, experience part of yeah. this go? And that may just be the most attractive part of our solution to, our, to the users. That's what they will get most compliment on. So short answer to your question is yes and yes. So uh, you can access from a browser, from your computer, or from your mobile device, both are supported. And not only it will, you can set alerts that if temperature goes higher than this thing, alert me, or if this happens, then alert me. So you can set up alerts of your own. We'll automatically detect if there's a hot spot. we will send you an alert, even if you didn't ask us to do so. And the nice thing about user interfaces, you, when you go there, you see a 3D view of your storage bin. You can even rotate and touch on something. They show me what's the temperature on this sensor. It'll pop up a little user interface icon and shows you what is the temperature and humidity inside. You can look at the historical data. It'll show me for the last three months, what was it like? Show me just this sensor and that sensor. So you have lots of options to slice and dice and look what you really want to look. But it has alerts. It says history. It's a user interface. You can say, this is my storage cycle beginning. Now I'm sold that corn. That's the end of the cycle. Just remember this data. I'm going to get to it next year again. So, yes, all kind of slicing and dicing and UI is available. Okay. And um, I would imagine the product needs to be specific to the, the commodity being stored, right? I mean, you, you have to have some sort of baseline for how corn should interact versus wheat versus soybeans. Is that right? Uh, no. So let me break down my no into a longer answer. 
it's the same hardware used for all of those things. The alert level, if temperature is rising, you know, if you get to 130 degrees, it doesn't matter, it's corn or wheat, you got a problem. So you want to know. Now, the difference comes in in the data science part. So we know with canola, if we're going over 8.5% moisture, that's a sensitive crop. You want to be watching it. And how it spoils is different than corn does. Corn, you know, you're at 14%, pretty good. 15, still good. 17, not so good. So the data science and the alerts level will change based on the type. But the hardware is the same and the basic software is the same. And by the way, it's not, we do have in Europe people using it for sugar beets and potatoes and uh, seed. Seed is a good one, by the way. And this is, uh, we're starting discussion with some, you know, there are contract farmers who are growing some seed for you. Seed is expensive. And they, you bring in the, uh, at the end of your harvest and you store it for two months and the company says, okay, bring it in. And if it doesn't meet the spec, they're docked. You know, they're not going to get paid or going to get docked so many cents a bushel. So now the company is asking farmers to use our equipment so can, they can see what is the moisture level, what's the quality score. And they say, you know, don't even make the journey because you're going to be docked 15 cents. That's up to you. It is basically optimizing the supply chain. Yeah, or back to your barley example earlier. If they have 200 farmers that each have on-farm bins with their seed in it, and each of them has a sensor, they can decide who to ship first partially based on the monitoring the quality in real time. Exactly. Germination matters. So let me give you one more example, which I think uh, some uh, growers will find uh, interesting. So you have a ground pile because access. So when do you sell it? Well, usually you sell it as soon as you can, maybe in March, maybe April. You don't want to be sitting there till June because only bad things can happen. Now, the difference in quality, you know, looking at the last year's data was huge. It was $3.10 a bushel around April, went up to $3.30 a bushel uh, in uh, June, I think even higher after that. So if you knew what was the quality, because you have our sensors in there, you have some confidence the quality is okay, I don't have any problem, you can time it. You can time when you pick up the pile. Not that only you can make a difference of 10, 20 cents a bushel, but the transport cost, trying to transport that to Pacific Northwest on a, 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 a rail car, I found the difference could be $3,200 per car to $2,400 per car within the six-week period. So not only you, you make more money per bushel, you save on transport costs. So this is an example of making a smart decision because you had the knowledge and improve your profitability. So that's, again, I said, knowledge is king, and growers need the knowledge. Very interesting. Well, what didn't I get a chance to to get us to here today that you were hoping to talk about or anything you want to add on to? No, Tim, it's uh, uh, very good to talk to you because you understand. You understand the, the difficulties. You understand the use case. You have touched grain yourself. You grew up in grain. So this is the easiest conversation I've had all my <laughs> Well, that means I didn't ask you hard enough questions. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's great. I, I appreciate this, and, and uh, I appreciate you taking time to be here, and this has been a really fun conversation for me, so thanks for being on the show. Thank you, Tim. Great to be here. Well, I really enjoyed that conversation with Naeem Zafar of Telesense. You can learn more about them at telesense.com. That's T-E-L-E-S-E-N-S-E dot com. Thanks as well to Fulcrum Global Capital, who partnered with me on this episode. You can learn more about Fulcrum at www.fgcvc.com. I'll give one more plug here for myself as well. I'm sending out my email newsletter on a more regular basis in 2021. It's kind of my New Year's resolution, focusing on what I call the front lines of ag tech, where product meets producer. You can sign up for that at futureofag.com. There's an email icon right there in the center of the page. So just click on it and we'll take you right to an email sign up form. So we'd love to communicate with you there as well. Thanks for your time and your attention. I really don't take it lightly. I'll be back next week with another story of ag innovation.